Let's keep the ball rolling. Uh, we have Destiny Watford and Greg Sautel. They're from Free Your Voice and United Workers in Baltimore. Y'all give it up. The land and the spaces that surround us are shaped by and are a reflection of the values of the societies we create. And our lives are shaped by the land that we occupy. My name is Destiny, and I'm from a place called Curtis Bay, a small community in South Baltimore that as recently as 2008 had the highest levels of toxic air emissions in the nation. When I walk through my neighborhood, what I hear are the constant sounds of truck barreling down the street. I see gray plumes billowing out of stacks, coals, coal being hauled into trains and piled into mountains ready to be shipped overseas. I see endless fleets of new imported cars parked in a massive lots ready to be circulated throughout the country. And then right across the street, I see people lining up outside churches to find a hot meal and kids playing in the park across the street from those mountains of coal. Parents at the local library filling out job applications online. I hear stories about people dying early from lung cancer and children trying to enjoy life while simultaneously suffering from asthma. I see and I hear the stories of high school students not knowing where they'll be sleeping from night to night. I see people facing eviction from homes that they're renting and that are literally falling apart and making them sick, but that they still can't afford. Wealth, power, and resources flow through my community every day right alongside poverty, disease, and the overwhelming feeling that somehow we, my community, has been selected, has been designated, has been utilized as a dumping ground, necessary to keep this operation of generating wealth possible. But all of this is a way of sacrificing a community, making it a dumping ground. It's not fate, and it's not an accident, I started to realize this four years ago when my friends and I, then in high school, started to, to ask basic questions about human rights. We formed a group called Free Your Voice, part of United Workers, a human rights organization. And we started on a journey around this question, what does it mean right now to stand up for our basic human rights, for ourselves, for our family, for our community, for our planet, and for our future? Years of struggle have led us to win major victories against something that would have been another toxic development in the history of environmental and economic injustice. This development came in the form of the nation's largest trash burning incinerator, and it would have been scheduled to be built less than a mile away from my community if we didn't fight back. An incinerator that would have imported 4,000 tons of trash every day, all from outside Baltimore to be burned, that would have been releasing 240 pounds of mercury every year and 1,000 pounds of lead. But we rose up, and after four long years, we stopped it. <laughs> the incinerator would have been a routine development in my community. The world wouldn't have missed a beat if we hadn't fought back. It, wouldn't ha it would have been celebrated as a green development by our officials, hailed as an economic plus and a jobs creator, making energy from trash a win-win. Burning trash is a renewable energy source by law in Maryland. Just like wind and solar, everyone can be happy. The structures, policies, incentives that have created the soil in my community grow rich for, are rich for growing developments like the incinerator. So what was our secret? How did we manage to defeat Goliath, this monster of a development? Truth is, it, there wasn't a silver bullet. No one held the key, but one lesson that I want everyone here to hear, everyone here to hear, <laughs> uh, is that our power comes from humanizing one another in a world that so often dehumanizes us. And this is what I think of when I say that the key of organizing and leadership development, 
I got into this work because the people in the group that I'm a part of actually cared about what I thought, listened to the concerns that I had, and the questions and curiosities I had about the world. Not to extract my story for some bigger fight, but simply to build an actual relationship based on dignity and respect. This strong bond, a belief that our lives are sacred, that we have ideas, that we are creative beings, is at the core of our fight. And our biggest victory was in that we created and continue to hold this space in a world that commodifies us in so many ways, that views us as clients or customers or consumers or victims. Our first step was to build that feeling across the community we took what we had learned and what we shared and what we knew about our neighbors and what we knew with our neighbors. We knocked on doors after doors and heard story after story of people suffering from lung cancer and respiratory disease and people dealing with asthma. And we honored these stories by making videos about Curtis Bay, about what we were proud of in the community, about what we thought needed to change. We gathered thousands of petitions from residents, months of work, built up to this huge action in 2013 that we planned to march from our school to the incinerator site less than a mile away. It was pretty amazing. It, we were all in like the bitter cold and we had organized residents, parents, students, and teachers and other supporters to march together. This was important for two reasons. The first, because it was the first time in a long time that there was an event like that in my community where people were unifying around an issue and demonstrating that in a big way. The second is that we got the media's attention and highlighted it as one of the biggest, and it turned out to be one of the biggest weaknesses of the incinerator, or highlighted the biggest weaknesses, the biggest weakness of the incinerator, which, that, which was that they were trying to build it less than a mile away from two public schools thus evading state law by calling it a power plant instead of an incinerator. Yeah. After the march, we had great momentum and built on our strategy. We found that the incinerator was in contract to sell renewable energy to 22 public entities. Baltimore public, the Baltimore Public City School System was one of them. We when we learned about this, we were pretty angry, but we also recognized that we found our leverage. We were a part of a public entity that was supporting the incinerator. We had a voice that mattered, and it wasn't okay that our public school system would be supporting a project that would harm us. We dug into those contracts, and we found each and every entity that we could pull out without penalty, or we found out that every entity could pull out without penalty in the spring of 2015 if the incinerator failed to pr provide energy. So we rallied together parents and students from the schools across the city around the issue to stop the incinerator. We used art, our, we used paintings and drawings and poems and songs to tell our story and to highlight their connection to the incinerator that they could, sell, that they could stand up and help break the cycle of failed developments coming into our neighborhood. And that led to this moment that we had built up to bring to light the hidden connection of the Baltimore City Public School System and the incinerator in front of the school board. Our approach was simple. Being in alignment with the incinerator, with the incinerator violated the essence of school at its core. So we provided the school board with the choice to get out of their contracts and meet their values of the essence of public education. And the result is that this combination of public pressure with creating an opportunity for the schools to do the right thing worked to create a path towards divestment. We continued this pattern of uh, analyzing entities and contracts with the incinerator at their core and calling them to take action. Entity after entity across the region pressured by a growing number of supporters across the state made the choice publicly to get out of their contracts with the incinerator. Even more, Baltimore City, which was previously a big fan of the project. This was huge, but the reality was that Energy Answers, the company building the incinerator, was still allowed to construct despite the overwhelming public outcry. In fact, 
they were more motivated to push forward and defy the efforts to halt their project. They claimed that, they, that we were misinformed and misinforming the public and that our community actually loved the incinerator and embraced it wholeheartedly. With the help from an amazing ally, an attorney at the Environmental Integrity Project, we learned that the incinerator's permit to construct was on shaky ground because of delays that we helped to cause and the state agency responsible for the health and the safety of the environment in Maryland, known as MDE, could act and determine that the permits were expired, thus halting all construction. We reached out to MDE for months, starting with a simple letter saying that the legal facts about the incinerator's permit were being or the permits being expired due to lack of construction at the site. We waited six months for a response. And the response from MDE, whose job it is to protect the lives and the health of all mailenders, was silence. We responded with thousands of petitions and video testimonies from residents that restated the basic facts, along with the pleas for MDE to do their job and enforce the law. More silence. We then decided to give MDE a deadline from the public to a public agency. A small group of us delivered a written and verbal notice that we were giving MDE 30 days to enforce the law. The consequence of failing to meet this deadline, that was up to us. <laughs> Wait, there's more. <laughs> Intensity was high. It was December of 2015 and Energy Answers was planning on construction in January 2016. It was the make it or break it moment in our campaign and we realized that we needed to escalate. So we gathered together everyone who had stood with us in our campaign, who believed in our struggle and our demonstration and in a demonstration of, a of hundreds of people, we all rallied outside of MDE with a simple plan to one by one hand in petitions to MDE with the most basic request, hey, do your job. MDE, lock the gates. But we were prepared. Seven supporters sacrificed their freedoms engaging in civil disobedience. And after months of schedule of continued pressure, the MDE finally heard the communities and the city's residents call in demand for a sustainable future that determined the and determined that the incinerator's permits were invalid, immediately stopping all construction. We won. But let's be honest with ourselves. Sure, the incinerator was horrible, and its defeat is a step in the right direction, but it's just the beginning. Developments like and worse than the incinerator are being proposed across the country and across the world. We need a new vision of how to do development, and in Curtis Bay, we're working together to build that vision. In fact, the incinerator site was made up of 90 acres of land, and now the conversation is about what's next. Now that the incinerator is out, we have a seat at the table. But let's think about that for a second, because we went from a group of high school students, a collective working to stop the incinerator from the outside, but because of our efforts, the company promised that whatever, the company that we're in dialogue with, promised that whatever that owns the land, um, promise that whatever development that happens will not be a smokestack, which is proof and a reflection of the power that we've built. This is big, but we need to work towards more than just the development, what the development won't be. And we need to work to find out what it should be. We're talking about real ways that we can create sustainable developments, like the, the amazing work that Eureka is doing. Thank you. Hey everybody, I always get the fun job of following destiny. Um, <laughs> my name is Greg Sautel, I'm in Baltimore. I'm a resident of Curtis Bay in the community that Destiny's from. And I wanna do a quick shout out to someone that, uh, whom without which none of this would be possible and that's uh, Destiny's mom, uh, Kimberly, who. 
maybe stepped out. But <laughs> so she came with us to, to Minneapolis. This is our first time being here. Um, and I want to give another quick shout out to Mr. Harold McRae uh, from Baltimore City Government, who actually journeyed in this morning. Who is uh, who runs the City Farms program in Baltimore City, and it's really significant to be joined uh, activists, residents, community leaders with folks from Baltimore City because we're really trying to build on the amazing momentum from Free Your Voice, from United Workers, um, and make the development at this, not this, into something like this at the 90-acre site. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to share really briefly um, sort of what we're up to now. So Destiny referred to the values and the principles that guide our work. Um, in Baltimore, and we refer to that as fair development. Um, and the idea is that essentially we're being held hostage, hostage in our communities. In Baltimore City, with the issue of waste, we're between a rock and a hard place. We're on the ground. We have tens of thousands of vacant buildings and homes, um, vacant lots that essentially are used as large dumping grounds, large trash cans. And the reason that they're vacant comes back to a similar root cause as to why this incinerator development was, was facilitated. And that's the vision and the values that drive development. So vacant buildings and lots in Baltimore are allowed to stay vacant oftentimes because they're being speculated on, they're being gambled, that the future value of those sites, of that land that could be serving an essential function and an essential purpose for us as human beings to meet our basic needs, instead is being used as a vehicle to make profit. Um, for folks that aren't living in the community. Um, and so that leaves us with blighted communities. On the other hand, with solutions that are given to deal with the waste that we have that's piling up our neighborhoods, they're often sort of technocratic solutions or ideas that it's out of sight, out of mind. And that's not okay, particularly when the, the brunt, the, the, the burden is placed on the backs of low-income communities of color. And Brooklyn Curtis Bay, um, is certainly that. It's a community that's been literally displaced over the years by environmental injustice. Literally three communities, Fairfield, Wagner's Point, and Hawkins Point, were all uprooted to make way for the city landfill um, and for polluting developments. So what we're working on is really a, a bottom-up, grassroots approach to development that puts values and human needs at the center um, and then works to rewire our city so that finances are actually flowing in to community-driven, genuinely democratic structures. In the case of Brooklyn Curtis Bay, we're developing a community land trust that's gonna allow residents to actually control uh, land, own land as a community, to develop permanently affordable housing that stays affordable. Um, in terms of the 90-acre site, we're working, we're not gonna own the land because it's got some stuff underneath it that we don't want to own, and it needs to be remediated for a long, long time. So, but we are going to try to drive the vision and the values on that land, and so we're actually doing things like community solar, uh, which just passed in Maryland uh, more recently than here in, in, in Minnesota, but it's, it's something in Maryland now, and we're going to take advantage of it, along with composting, recycling, um, and other things that are directly taking on what this incinerator pretended to be a solution to. Um, but really, what I really want to leave you with, and this is my final word, is that these ideas and these, these values are, are crucial, but without us really taking seriously the issue of power and how we build it from the bottom up, these ideas are going to remain as ideas, and we're not going to be able to mobilize. And if anything resonates um, from, from what myself and Destiny are sharing, it's that, is that we really need to grapple with the issue of power um, in, a, in a real way and in, in form alliances that really cross communities, cross cities, cross the country, and really cross the world, because the challenges that we face are not simply local challenges, they're global challenges. Um, and so I'm really pleased to be here today and to engage with this network and with this community and hopefully bring this energy and this excitement back to our city. Um, thank you.